spend £1,500 a month on clothes. But that all changed after she went to India for a BBC documentary to see what working conditions are like there. Tonight, in a new programme, she looks at the controversial issue of child labour. Faye Southwell has been to meet her. Back home at the cafe where she used to work, Stacey Dooley has spent the past year travelling to Africa and Nepal, filming a BBC documentary about child labour. What she found in the two countries shocked her. Just walk down the road, come in here, there's five young children working here. This boy thinks he's ten, he's been working for a year, he's come from India, he works 14 hours a day and he sleeps on the floor. The contrast is unbelievable. It's like a different world, not a different side of the world, you know? And I think we're just incredibly lucky here. Like, that sounds really <laughs> this world, but we are. We're, we're so, so lucky to live in England and have all the opportunities that we have and not have to work our kids for, for free or for 30p a day. Then, in a break between filming, the crew are approached by another boy, 11-year-old Mansood. He gets beat every day quite badly. He's been hospital twice. The owner just picks him up and slaps him on the floor. The film crew takes action. First, we have to request the police to rescue him. So the next step is to find the police and ask them to rescue him? Yeah, we can. Let's do that today. Today? Yeah, today I can. why not? Later, Stacy helps in the rescue of a girl sold age 10 who spent three years working as a domestic slave. These are a 13-year-old girl's hands. They look so old. They're swollen and stubbly because of um, they've been working so much. Stacey is now hoping the documentary will encourage people here to do more. People in England who have got just a little bit of time or maybe just a tiny bit of money. I know everyone is a bit skin and everyone's always busy, but just anything, anything that we can do here to help people that are just so, so poor and so desperate, I think... It's not a massive deal to us, you know. I think we probably should. Stacey Dooley. Well, next tonight, the company that began in a garage but now employs 4,000 people. Marshalls of Cambridge has several claims to fame. It built the nose of Concord and trained 20,000 aircrew during the Second World War. That's come a long way, and in that time, it celebrates its centenary now. Our business correspondent, Richard Bond, has been taking a look at its history. Looking after the planes of the RAF is bread and butter work for Marshalls. This is a tri-star in for modifications. Marshalls employs 1,700 people in its aviation division. Tom Bainbridge is one of them. Late 70s it was built uh, and the RAF have had it since about 1982-83. So yeah, so it, it needs a bit of tender loving care to keep it going and keep it flying. Today, Marshalls employs nearly 4,000 people, spanning not just aircraft, but motor dealerships, vehicle engineering and Cambridge Airport. It all began with this man. David Marshall was poor. He started life as a college servant in Cambridge. With a bank loan, he bought two cars to chauffeur wealthy students home. In 1909, the business was born. He was a man of some great style, and he equipped both of the cars with a, a livery chauffeur in uniform. So he was providing really an outstanding service to his customers. After the First World War, Marshalls became the Cambridge distributor for Austin Cars. The family opened a flying school in 1929 and bought the land on which the airport now stands. During the last war, Marshall started repairing aircraft. It also trained 20,000 pilots. A vehicle bodybuilding business was started after the war, and the aviation division kept on growing. Marshalls built the distinctive nose for Concorde. Today, Marshalls is run by the grandson of the founder. But can it really keep going as a family business? Nobody knows for the, into the very long term. Certainly for the um, coming years it will and my son is working in the business very effectively now. People will always need uh, transport, uh, the country will always need defence, and those are very strong sort of uh, foundations. A family day attended by 14,000 people was part of Marshall's anniversary celebrations. A family day for a family firm which really did take off. Richard Bond, BBC Look East, Cambridge. Now, we've just been talking about our next story in here. Now, there's nothing better than homegrown apples, but I think it's pretty sad. When you see them kind of left on a tree, unpicked, 
or worse when they're on the ground turning to mush. So that's a waste. It is a waste. Now, in one corner of Suffolk, volunteers have launched a new share an apple scheme to try to stop fruit being wasted. Kevin Birch has been to see it in action. When I was young, this kind of thing was called scrumping and distinctly frowned upon. But when these volunteers venture into the orchard, crucially with the owner's permission, everyone's delighted. They're welcomed with open arms. They've all been days like this. It's been such a fabulous year to do it. We've been so lucky and um, we've had so much fun, as you can see, with the apple pickers. The idea is simple and part of a wider sustainability scheme in Beckles. They collect apples which owners no longer want or simply can't pick themselves and pass them on to people who need them. I think it's important because of the waste aspect. It is very sad and lots of people that we talk to about the project agree with us. I was keen to have a go and lend a hand first. Let's get down to basics. So what's this called? Is this just a... It's an apple picker. Well, <laughs> I should have worked on that, shouldn't I? No more technical than that. Absolutely. Well, it's just quite exhilarating and, you know, you try and get the apples in the hoop and it's rather like playing lacrosse at school, catching the ball in the net and it's quite a fun feeling. The land belongs to Peter Kerrison. He suffered a stroke. It affected his balance and made apple picking too risky. He's delighted to see them put to use. It is very nice that they come and as they go, I gather to a, a worthwhile place. It's well worth it. Otherwise, it goes on the bonfire. Hey! Yes, yes, well done. Done. They don't pay for the fruit or charge for it, but much of it will be turned into chutneys, cakes, puddings and pies to support charity fundraising. Already the number of apples collected is running into thousands. Kevin Birch, BBC Look East. Well, I hope, I hope they turn some of it into cider. <laughs> yes. I mean, that really You'd would like be a that. waste. I would Good like that. Good, those yeah. apple pickers, aren't there? Now, Julie, you're going to tell us all about September. Yeah, Kelsapri. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very dry month with high pressure in charge for most of the time. So how much or little rain did we see? Well, these are some of the figures from across the region. So Royston was one of the driest spots, only eight millimetres of rain. That's just over half an inch. But that's only 15% of the average rainfall figure expected in September for that area. Colchester, that was one of the wetter spots with 35 millimetres. But actually, a lot of that fell on the 15th, on just one day. So despite the slightly higher rainfall figure, a lot of the month was actually dry. And just to put this into context, well, Bedford, their average should be around 54 millimetres, so just over two inches. They only got nine millimetres. And at Watersham, their average rainfall figure, similar, around 55 millimetres. Here, only 20 millimetres of rain. On the 1st of October... Well, that brought very little change. The uh, cloud out of the sky, well, the cloud in the sky, produced very little rain. If we can take a look at the satellite picture, there it is. Uh, that thicker cloud producing, as I said, very little rain. We had a little bit of light rain and drizzle in places. But for most of us, a dry day and a dry night to follow. Uh, again, variable amounts of clouds, some clear spells, but a pretty quiet night and a chillier night than last night. We're looking at lows of around... Uh, seven celsius for many of us but an odd spot could drop a degree or so lower than that and as last night most of us stayed in double figures it will feel noticeably colder and uh, the winds are mainly light northwesterly so high pressure still in charge tomorrow some weather fronts to the north but a very familiar day yet again. We'll have some cloudier moments, hopefully a little bit of brightness and sunshine. If we're going to see any light rain and drizzle, it'll be in the north, but even here I think it will stay largely dry. Highs of around 15 Celsius, which is 59 degrees Fahrenheit, with a, a light to moderate uh, west to northwesterly wind. And then Saturday, we can now see a little bit of early brightness. The front delayed moving through during the afternoon, but it's weakening all the time. So I think we're now looking at just showers, not for everyone, and most of them on the light side. And still a very windy day on Saturday with a good moderate to fresh southwesterly. Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, believe it or not, that high pressure builds back in again. So it's returned to dry weather for everybody. And I should just point out that on Sunday night, we could see a low of 3 Celsius. The ground's still quite warm, but with that kind of temperature, we are likely to see a touch of ground frost in places. And just before I go, if you want to check your barometer, it should be around 1,018 millibars, which is 30.06 inches of mercury. See you tomorrow. Thank you very much, Julie.
And that's all from us for this evening. Have a very good evening, won't you? Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.